Oregonians had a lot to vote on this election season. The President, the U.S. House of Representatives, four statewide offices, all of our state representatives, 16 state senators, and an abundance of state and local ballot measures. Barack Obama won, the Democrats kept the U.S. Senate, and the GOP still controls the U.S. House. Democrats in the Oregon State Legislature now have a majority in the Oregon House after last session's 30-30 split. Today, we're fortunate to have the opportunity to hear a discussion between State GOP Chair Alan Alley and Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Our discussion leader will be Wendy Willis. Wendy is a national leader in the field of civic engagement and citizen-centered decision-making. She's the executive director of the Policy Consensus Institute and director of research and development for the National Policy Consensus, Consensus Center at Portland State University. Prior to her current positions, she was City Club's executive director. Wendy is also a poet and has just released her first book of poems, Blood Sisters of the Republic. And without further ado, please help me welcome Wendy Willis. Gosh, it's great to be back at City Club. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm, an, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to moderate this panel. I'm going to introduce our two, two uh, speakers to you, and here they come. Uh, I don't know that they need much introduction, but it's, it's fun. Uh, so I will introduce them to you first. We're joined by Alan Alley. Welcome, Alan. Uh, many Oregonians are likely to know Alan Alley either personally or politically for his walk across Oregon in 2009 when he spent 36 days walking the state from east to west. Alan has experience that spans multiple disciplines from engineering to marketing, venture capital, entrepreneurship, and most recently, public service. Alan even bridges the divide between Oregon's political poles, serving as the deputy chief of staff to Governor T Ted Kulongoski in 2007 and he serves as the current chair of Oregon's Republican Party. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Next, Earl Blumenauer, who has been a lifelong resident of, or of Oregon's third congressional district. Through his years as a local official in the Oregon legislature, Multnomah County Commission, and Portland City Council, Earl has developed a national reputation for his advocacy of public transportation, land use planning, protection of the environment, and school funding. Earl's valuable work has helped Portland become one of the nation's most livable cities. He currently serves on the Ways and Means Committee, and he's the founder of the Public Broadcasting Caucus and the Bipartisan Bicycle Caucus. Now, I, I would like to have you welcome both Congressman Blumenauer and Alan Alley, but we'll end with a big round of applause, but we'll ask you to hold the rest of your applause for the rest of the program. Thank you. So I'm going to, um, I have some questions for, for both of you and uh, some for you individually. We'll start one for both. If you, if you had the opportunity to write the headline uh, for the Oregonian the day after the election, what, what headline uh, would you pick? We'll start with Congressman Blumenauer. I would just say it was a, it was a good evening. <laughs> Mr. Alley? Well, picking up on that, I'd say it wasn't. <laughs> Okay, now I'll give you the opportunity to write the first paragraph. How would you summarize, how would you summarize the election, both nationally, uh, regionally, and locally? And this, we'll start with Mr. Alley this time. And... Well, it wasn't what I expected. And if you saw me on television when they interviewed me at 8.01 and, and basically said, well, now Mitt Romney's lost and you've lost four seats in the Oregon House and the Senate didn't go your way and Newt Bueller lost and a few other things, uh, I, was, I was shocked and taken aback that uh, I really believed that, especially Newt, had run a tremendous campaign and he had endorsements from all over the state. Uh, I thought Kate had made some, uh, some strategic blunders through the process. Uh, I think she had, um, she had run the office in a uh, partisan manner, and that's an office that people don't look to to be a highly partisan office. So that, that one really surprised me. 
And I said that night that I need to go back and, and look at the game films a little bit. And uh, the Oregonian was, was nice enough this morning to, uh, to write an editorial that basically was uh, digging the hole and kicking the dirt in on top of us. Um, and I'd give you some data that I don't think you all would, would uh, necessarily recognize. There's one party in the state from 2008 to 2010 that has lost 50,000 registered voters. There's another major party in the state that lost 6,000 registered voters during that same period of time. Uh, there's one party in the state that holds five seats in the House where they're in a registration minority. There's one party in the state that holds zero seats in the House where they're in a registration minority. And there's one party in the state where their presidential candidate did better in 36 counties than in 2008, all 36 counties. And that was the Republican Party. Now, part of the message that I think both Earl and I need to recognize is the Democrats are down 50,000 registered voters since 2008. The Republicans are down six. All other parties are up 128,000 registered voters in Oregon since 2008. And I think, so, so the situation is, I think, different than what the data suggests that it's different than what the Oregonian suggested. But I think the one thing that the Oregonian didn't pick up on is uh, Congressman Blumenauer's party lost 50,000 registered voters and about 3% in registration. We lost 1% registration while all others picked up the part that, that we lost. And I think if neither of us really recognize that and come to grips with it, ultimately in a two-party system, that third group is becoming as big or bigger than either the group that uh, Congressman Blumenauer represents or I represent. Thank you, Congressman Blumenauer. Gee, I'm really depressed after listening to that. <laughs> um, Alan. I think makes a valid point, but I would frame the election slightly different because there was a national and a state election on two starkly different approaches politically and different visions for the future. A billion dollars was spent against Barack Obama um, and a candidate, uh, Governor Romney, relentlessly organized focused overcoming billionaires in the Republican nominating process and staked out as clearly and forcefully as one could imagine um, a vision of extreme conservatism, running against Obamacare, running against uh, a very bad economy, and none of us are going to dispute that. Uh, the American public looked at it, listened to it, and rejected that approach. Barack Obama won in the face of unprecedented political headwinds. The headlines that there was no difference in Congress is just categorically wrong. If we were having this conversation six months ago, Alan would be betting me you know, how much the Republicans are going to gain in controlling the United States Senate and what would Harry Reid do after he's no longer majority leader. We not only held the Senate, we added one seat, and the only loss we suffered in Nebraska was Ben Nelson's seat, and candidly, we're better off with Deb Fisher, whoever she is, than Ben Nelson as a Democrat. <laughs> My friend and colleague Chris Murphy withstood $100 million of Linda McMahon and won a Senate seat and replaces a guy who caucused with us, Joe Lieberman, but was off the reservation and a thorn in the side and unpredictable and actually spoke at the last party's nominating convention. So from my vantage point, in the House, we picked up 10 seats and lost 10 Tea Party Republicans, including Alan West in Florida, who raised $15 million. Well, of course, he's demanding a recount and impounding voting machines. I find no small amount of irony, a uh, Republican complaining about voting irregularities in Florida. Um, 
but I think it was a very stark choice. Barack Obama carried Clackamas County. Did he Rep carry Multnomah? Uh, we are confident he did. I think so. But this was a very stark choice. Yes, the two political parties need to have a reality check because people are gravitating towards independent category. That's, that's where the growth is. But if you look at how they're voting, they, the independents in Oregon track much more frequently with Democrats. They agree with Democrats on marriage equality. They agree with Democrats on climate change. They agree with Democrats on uh, uh, equity in terms of revenues. I, I will stop, but I just want to say, I think we, we, you're right. All of us need to have a reality check, and I think we need less hyper-partisanship. But we just had a national election on two very clear, different views. Notwithstanding, we saw a different Mitt Romney in the last two weeks. But that campaign was a stark choice. Americans chose decisively, nationally, and in Oregon. I disagree. So one of the things you both talked about was um, people moving toward, to, toward a more independent status. And when asked, Oregonians and Americans will say they believe that political parties are actually there to protect their own interests, not to protect the interests of the people. So given that that's the stance that Americans take toward political parties of both stripes, how do you re-engage the public in governance? Now that the election's over, how does the public participate in governance? Well, I think uh, it's interesting that Congressman Blumenauer immediately went to a uh, paid political announcement. And I tried not to do that. And I think it, it's an interesting contrast. Because I was, uh, and maybe this is what happens when you win versus when you lose, is that maybe the loser is a little more introspective and uh, goes back to the data to try to understand what was happening. On the national scene, uh, I don't see it the way you see it. It's very hard to unseat an incumbent. Uh, Barack Obama was swept in in 2008, and the referendum, I think this time, the country's very, very evenly split. And in fact, way more geographic uh, areas moved toward uh, the Republican in 2012 than in 2008. That I, I mentioned every single county in Oregon voted more for Mitt Romney than they did for John McCain. We, we lost, but it definitely was a move. And I think we have to, A, we have to recognize that. But B, the other thing is, is that all those 128,000 people that are out there that when your party loses 51,000 registered voters, my party loses 6,000 registered voters, and all those other people pick up 128,000, maybe because we're in the minority, we have to focus on winning Republicans, independents, and I need a few Democrats to win statewide. Democrats only need Democrats, and they need to split the independents. They don't even need to win the independents to win statewide. So maybe you can have a hyper-partisan message, and that will actually elect people statewide. I don't think it's the right thing for Oregon. I think we have to be able to appeal to Republicans, independents. And for Republicans, we've got to have 15% of the Democrats vote with us. Democrats need 0% of the Republicans to win statewide. I think it's a, it's a huge difference, and something that I've certainly recognized and am striving to make the Republican Party, Oregon's party, not the party of just the Republicans. Thanks, Mr. Elliott. Before you answer, Congressman Blumenauer, I just want to, um, I'm going to come back to you and ask the question again after Congressman Blumenauer um, answers, because the question really is about how do Oregonians and Americans get involved in, get reconnected to self-governance? Not, not what the next election will be, but what, what happens tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that? when um, important decisions are going to be made, and how do, how do Americans uh, reconnect to, to their government? And I think that is what the, the nature of the challenge is. And one of the things I have worked on throughout my political career and have talked about 
consistently before the City Club on probably more occasions than you care to have put up with, is the civic infrastructure. The role that people play. Uh, my, my first uh, uh, projects for the City Club dealt with citizen engagement uh, uh, in terms of campaign spending reform, in terms of being able to access voting. Um, the Obama campaign was fueled by massive, small individual contributions. Um, not so much Goldman Sachs and billionaires. Um, the people who overcome, overcame unprecedented efforts to make it hard to vote were part of what, I mean, I can give you stories uh, that are chilling in this day and age of how hard certain states made it for people to exercise the right to vote. So this campaign would not have been successful if it hadn't had massive engagement. I would like us to go forward at this point dealing with a series of initiatives that don't have to be divisive. I travel the country preaching bike partisanship. <laughs> Republicans and Democrats support that. A lot of our work with livability in terms of agriculture reform, in terms of how we rebuild and renew America. Last night I gave a presentation, a few of you heard, uh, at the old church about water for the world, trying to help poor people around the globe with sanitation and safe drinking water. I would like us to shift into things that have been bottled up in the house, where the American public supports them overwhelmingly, and I would say one of them is public broadcasting, by the way, two-thirds of Republicans want public broadcasting funding to remain the same or be increased. And I would like to hope that the fire big bird part of the presidential campaign would help us move past that and that we can work on these things that the American public supports. And we're going to see a couple of issues going forward where the states are driving us on reforming our drug laws, reforming our uh, marriage equality. I mean, these are things that I hope the political process at the federal level will engage because this is what the public wants, and that's going to make, whether they're Republican, Democrat, or independent, less likely to be cranky, less likely to be resistant, and I think more likely to be positive about where we are and where we're going. Thank you, Mr. Alley. Do you have anything to add? Well, my perspective is different. Um, I think everything you talked about was another government program in some way, shape, or form. And my perspective is we have to get the private sector going again. I was with uh, kids at the Oregon Association of Minority Entrepreneurs, something I've been doing for five years. And these are kids that come in and they want to learn about entrepreneurship and how to start a company and, and what to do. And they were, they were feeling that their aspirations weren't something that the community was embracing. And I was there to tell them that your aspirations of creating a better life for you and for your family and for your community uh, are all in your hands. It's all your destiny. It's not somebody else is going to come in and fund you to do it. It isn't like you're going to get a, a handout to do it. Uh, you all have a wonderful public education system. There's state universities that you can take advantage of. I took advantage of them. And that you can aspire your own self-destiny and your own self-direction, you can aspire to do things better. And you don't have to wait for somebody to do it for you. You don't have to wait for the government to take care of you. Somebody said when this election, it's difficult to run against Santa. And it is. It's difficult to run against uh, something where somebody says, look, you don't have to worry about it. I'm going to take care of you. That there will be a program to take care of that. And it's a fundamental difference in, in philosophy, I think. Sorry, I lost my voice for a second. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Congressman Blumenauer, a question for you. Um, 
as you know, uh, pr con congressional approval level is at, a, at an all-time low. And so now Deservedly that, so. And as you go back into the next, you know, finishing up this Congress and going into the next one, what is the mandate for Congress to, um, and what, what needs to be accomplished between now and, and uh, in the next, say, year or so? Well, I, I sometimes wonder who the 13 percent of the people are who approves of Congress's performance. Um, you get no quarrel from me. No quarrel from me. I was stunned that for the first time in our history, there were people in the House of Representatives that were seriously talking about the United States defaulting on its payment for the national debt for money we'd already spent. That sent a tremor up Wall Street and, frankly, sent a bunch of Wall Street to Washington, D.C. to try and talk them uh, off the ledge. The fact that we couldn't pass a farm bill, we couldn't do anything for drought uh, assistance in the midst of a terrifying drought across two-thirds of the country, that the Republicans wouldn't even bring the farm bill to the floor, that for the first time in history, we had a partisan transportation bill that never even had a hearing in committee. I mean, this was unprecedented, outrageous, embarrassing as a member of that body. Now, any of you have been in my office, there are only two pictures of politicians. I didn't plan it that way, but it turned out. One was Tom McCall that I had the privilege of working with 40 years ago, and the other is Mark Hatfield. And I took a little flack for organizing and chairing Democrats for Hatfield in his last re-election because, frankly, my party had somebody who I didn't think was up to it. I think this mindless, hyper-partisanship, my way or the highway, uh, being manipulative of the process in a way that is unprecedented. You know, the guy who beat Dick Luger, who is no disrespect to Jeff or Ron, but Dick Luger is maybe my best friend in the Senate. The guy who beat him in the primary immediately uh, on his first interview on Fox, appropriately enough, said, of course I believe in bipartisanship. Democrats ought to agree with us. This has to change. And the American public cast blame on lots of people in Congress, but they identified that the dysfunction is largely because of what happened in the House, doing, holding things hostage that should never have happened, and the fact that Republicans stopped legislating. It took, it now takes 60 votes for the most mundane of function an abuse of the, quote, filibuster that is unprecedented in history. We can't get nonpartisan judicial appointments voted on when both senators of both parties agree. So it, it's going to need an attitude adjustment, I think, and I will tell you it's already underway. It's already underway, and you can hear it in what Boehner is saying, and you can see some people starting to figure out they can't be anti-immigrant, they can't be anti-gay, they can't be anti-woman. Um, and that's going to make a difference. Thank you. Mr. Alley, um, I know there's a lot of talk, as this happens in presidential elections, there's now a lot of talk about the identity of the Republican Party um, and what this election means both about uh, the past and the future for the party. And I want to give you a chance to share uh, with people your thoughts on that, on that question. Well, I think it's, it's a continuation of some of the things that we've seen. I think um, Congressman Blumenauer and I agree that there was a national referendum about two very distinct views about how to move the country forward. And from my perspective, what the country said is, I can't really make up my mind. I mean, it's, it's it, yes, Barack Obama won. There's no doubt about that. But if you look at the demographics and you look at how it breaks down, we're very, very divided. As a country, we're very, very divided. And um, we do need to, to move forward. And I think uh, the Republican Party and the message has to be 
uh, a message about getting the economy going again. Um, I, I, want to, I want to frame a discussion. Um, we talk a lot about debt, and we talk a lot about, about bonds and, and things. I don't know if you all kind of understand this, but we go to Walmart, we buy a bunch of things from China, and we send a bunch of dollars over to China. Those dollars sit in China, and they can't really do anything with them because we don't make enough stuff for them to buy things back from us. So we cooked up this idea of where we could get those dollars back by giving them a bond. And we sell that bond to China, and they send the dollars back here to the United States. And then we keep deficit spending. I thought that this would end when we do a failure of a Treasury bond sale. But it didn't because the Federal Reserve came back in and bought some of those bonds. When we couldn't sell enough of those bonds, the Federal Reserve came back and bought those bonds. This architecture that we have in place fundamentally isn't sustainable. If it was done in the private sector, you guys would be all over them about creating a scheme that isn't a sustainable scheme. And I, I hope Democrats and Republicans both recognize that. You can't sort of catastrophically just stop, uh, cut the federal budget by, uh, what is it, $1.2 trillion. You can't just do that in one fell swoop, but I hope both sides do understand that. So from a Republican Party standpoint going forward, we're going to be the advocates of, of small business. We're going to be the advocates of getting the economy going again. And we're going to be the advocates of entrepreneurship and aspiration and the difference between aspiration and, and hope. But I hope, I aspire that we both recognize that this uh, system that we've created is not a sustainable system. Thank you. Just to change um, gears for a second, this is a question for both of you. The Guardian newspaper um, reported on Wednesday morning that Tuesday night was the largest night for gay rights in, in, the history, in American history. So I'd like to have you both reflect a little bit on both what happened and what you see the future for marriage equality and other issues of, um, of gay and lesbian rights are uh, in the country. Mr. Alley, can we start with you? Sure. I spent quite a bit of time talking to uh, some gay Republicans at the event on Tuesday night. And they came to me and said, Alan, you know, we're gay Republicans. We believe in what you're doing. We support what you're doing. We're entrepreneurs. We're business people. We want to be involved. And we had a long discussion about how to do that and how to, how to be inclusive of that group of people in the Republican Party and creating a home for them. And it was, it was very encouraging for me to have that kind of discussion. And I think it's something that we need to do to move forward. We need to include all these different groups. We need to have the big tent. Like I said, I've, I've spent a lot of time at the uh, Oregon Association of Minority Entrepreneurs and bringing them in. I've spent five years going every fourth Friday at seven o'clock in the morning working with the young people and working with the other groups there. So um, I see the Republican Party becoming more of a big tent. Uh, we ran some candidates uh, like Manuel Castaneda. If you get into some of the uh, opening up to the Hispanic community, Manuel's been a great representative of the, Re of the Republican Party, and I expect that to continue. Thank you. Congressman Blumenauer? Uh, as far as gay rights are concerned, it's game over. Within the decade, there will be full marriage equality in the United States. Um, we have two presiding officers of state houses of representatives that are gay. Tammy Baldwin was elected to the Senate in an extraordinarily volatile state of Wisconsin. Anybody remember anything going on in Wisconsin this year? And she was running against a three-term governor. Her sexual orientation was not an issue in the campaign. And she's going to be in the United States Senate, the first open lesbian in the United States Senate. But the main reason it's game over is that the people under 45 have decided long ago, this, this isn't an issue. 
and geezer baby boomers like me are going to be dying out. And the Republican Party, I, I, I was in the Oregon legislature in 1973 when we came within one vote of anti-discrimination legislation. And that bill was carried by Lloyd Kinsey, a Republican from Northeast Portland, who still lives there. And as soon as the Republican Party embraces, not learning how to talk about it, but embraces marriage equality, anti-discrimination, we're all going to be better off, and the Republican Party will be stronger for it, and I welcome that, because I don't want two parties that are divided over a fundamental human right like sexual orientation any more than I want them divided over racial inequality or anti-discrimination for immigrants. Um, it's a prescription not just for a poor Republican Party, it's a prescription for a poor country. And I will tell you, it's game over as far as gay rights is concerned, and I think you're going to see the same pivot on immigration uh, this decade. And if the Republicans are smart, they will let us do it in the House this Congress. Thank you. So, Alan, this is City Club, and we have a big reputation for being po policy wonks. But we also like a little gossip. And I, um, I, I, I heard that you have some good stories from the campaign. So do you want to, um, would you like to share one of your favorites with us? Um, well, there's one sort of anecdotal thing that I, struck me. Uh, neither uh, President Obama nor Mitt Romney put significant money in the state that I know of. Maybe, maybe there was, but I just wasn't aware of it. And what it resulted in is there weren't uh, bumper stickers and lawn signs for Romney or Obama available for free. Um, I, I don't know if that's true on your side, but that was uh, certainly on our side. And what happened in the Republican Party is a guy in Lane County said, well, I'm not going to stand for this, and he went out and printed up 500 lawn signs. And they cost him a couple of bucks a piece, and he started putting them out. And somebody came to him and said, hey, I'd like a few of those. So he printed 500 more and sold them for $3 a piece, who then sold them to his friends. And this whole thing got started. Uh, by the end, we had uh, 10,000 lawn signs that were printed right here in Oregon. The printer actually hired three extra people to do this. They were delivered all around the state by kind of a Pony Express. In fact, I was driving them around the state as well. And we'd drive them from here to Clackamas County. Somebody from Hood River would come and pick them up in Clackamas County and take them around the state. And it was very entrepreneurial. And it was very grassroots. And it was very reflective of kind of the values of the Republican Party. And it was, it was, really, it was really heartwarming. And this, uh, this gentleman, Chuck, who did the whole thing, did it very altruistically, and uh, it, was a, it was an incredible experience to, to watch it happen. Thank you. That, that is a great story. Thanks. So, Earl, what was your biggest surprise? So when you, you know, now that you reflect back, you look, you look at the whole country, and th what was the thing that surprised you the most? The biggest surprise for me um, on election night was that Michelle Bachman, despite 12 or 14 million dollars in her re-election campaign in a very Republican district, the most Republican district in Minnesota, almost lost. I was stunned. I still am. But I get to serve with her for another term. Thank you. Do you have a surprise you'd like to share? From election night? Um, the whole thing was pretty much a surprise. <laughs> So I think we should talk about Clackamas <laughs> County. Uh, so given, given that there's allegations of voter fraud, there's, uh, there's um, or I guess yes, I should say elections fraud, uh, and there's uh, two, uh, sort of two outstanding races in the county commission that they've been advised not to call, what do we, how do we look at something like that in our own backyard and prevent, uh, prevent events like that to happen in the future? Uh, Congressman Blue, now would you like to reflect on that? Well, I think that both parties ought to make a top priority for the next Congress having uniform guidelines for 
elections across the country. It's insane that we have almost 4,000 local county officials of various degrees of competence and integrity running a fractured voting system like we've got. I mean, it is, it is truly, in some cases, banana republic. We should have a national vote-by-mail system, I think. Um, Oregon, it works. It's cost-effective. It's not tamper-proof, we're finding out, with Clackamas County, perhaps. But there are ways that you can, you can provide the mechanism. Um, I have a young staff person who took vacation to go to one of the poorest districts in Virginia uh, to do some canvassing, voter information, and poll monitoring. She was at a polling place where the line took five hours. It was 45 degree temperature, wind blowing. It took them over three hours to get inside there were two voting machines. In the adjacent precinct, which was white and Republican, there were more machines, no lines, and people were inside. And they had exactly the same situation four years earlier. That's a scandal in this country. And I mentioned my friend, and no, he's not my friend, Alan West is demanding that voting machines be impounded. He's suing. He, you know, he wants to call in the Canadian Mounties. And, and I just think that we ought to professionalize and depoliticize the election mechanism in this country. Other countries do it. And I hope that the city club makes that here, that we, that we deal with civic education and, and streamlining the voter process. But I think that ought to be a number one bipartisan effort to departisanize, if that's a word, um, the election process, to professionalize it and ideally make it vote by mail nationally, we deserve the integrity of the ballot box. There shouldn't be questions like this. There shouldn't be a war on voting, no matter which party people are in. Uh, the stories you're going to hear that happened in the last two weeks to prevent people from voting are just going to make your toes curl. Mr. Alley, do you Yeah, and I, I, I think, again, and maybe it's because you're an elected official and I'm not, uh, throwing out things like the war on voting I don't think is productive, especially when we're trying to talk about doing this in a bipartisan manner, and we happen to agree. Uh, Clackamas County, it looks like there was a person that was acting independently and did a horrible thing. Um, now, but we do have to clean up this process, and I'll give you an anecdotal story in my own life. My daughter's registered here in Oregon. She goes to school in California. Somebody comes to her in California, says, would you like to register in California? She goes, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. I'm registered in Oregon. They go, oh, no problem. You know, we just fill this out, check this off, and we'll take care of it. She gets a ballot in Oregon. She gets a ballot in California. And there's no reciprocity across the states. There's no checking across the states. It also happens cross-county here in Oregon, where you move to a different county the Secretary of State will tell you that they, that they validate this cross-county. It actually doesn't happen. And we need to clean it up. It should be one person, one vote. And all of the valid people to vote should be voting. And I absolutely agree with you. And the system should be cleaned up. I happen to like vote by mail. Um, it's especially good in rural Oregon, so people don't have to drive 70 miles to get to a ballot box. Um, the Republicans actually turned out, remarkably enough, 2% better than the Democrats did in Oregon in this cycle. And part of it was is that we do have vote by mail, so people in rural communities can vote just as easily as people in, uh, in metropolitan areas. So I agree with you. We need, we need to work on that and clean it all up.
Thank you. So I'm going to ask you both now, this is the last question I get to ask you, to take off your partisan hats and put them on the table for a minute and, and to pull up your American socks. Um, and as a citizen, what's the piece, the one piece of advice you would give President Obama going forward in this next term? Uh, so Congressman Blumenauer, should we start with you? Uh, for me, it is to operationalize the the rhetoric of both campaigns that we have to do business differently. Now, Alan and I disagree in terms of the role of government. You know, I, I think that, or, or maybe he doesn't, maybe, I don't know if he's talking about turning this stuff over to the private sector. Remember, Governor Romney talked about turning FEMA over to the private sector. Um, and in the face of uh, Hurricane Sandy, that caused doubt in the minds of some people. There are certain things that government needs to do. Um, I think it's a partnership in terms of rebuilding and renewing the country, infrastructure, uh, providing access to education. There are a few people in this room that benefited from the GI Bill, either personally or your parents or grandparents. But we can't continue spending more on defense than the next 40, than the next 15 countries combined, at a rate of rate of increase greater than the rate of inflation, and we can't continue to spending more on health care than any other country in the world, almost twice as much as most, and a rate of inflation greater than inflation. We have to do business differently, and I do think that both President Obama and Governor Romney had some ideas about that. It came up in the campaign. I mean, the health care bill has embodied in it virtually all of what used to be bipartisan um, reforms. I hope that he focuses on accelerating these changes in health care, in defense, in agriculture. Um, we in Oregon get cheated by the national agricultural policies dramatically. Um, and this is a chance because both candidates, I think, believed in it. And President Obama is all about legacy now, not re-election. And so I hope we can accelerate this doing business differently. Mr. Alley? Well, I think my advice would be something around uh, exactly what I talked about earlier. The Republicans really believe that this debt crisis that we have is a crisis, and we have to start dealing with it now. And I think actually many people in my party has, has done a disservice over the past several years because with Republicans and Democrats, we wanted more, we just wanted more different stuff. And the compromises and the horse trading were around Republicans got different stuff than the Democrats got, but we just wanted more. There's a significant group in the Republican Party that says 16 trillion is enough, and we just want less. And we want to figure out how we can get to less. And if you think, think about this, we've got a compromise between less and more that's very different than a compromise between more and more different stuff. And I think that's the fundamental tension, and I don't know that the Republicans have articulated it as clearly as they should, but that's the fundamental tension that we're dealing with, and I'd like President Obama to be sensitive to that because it's very different than the way it used to be. Thank you both very much. Thank you to our panel for what uh, is a good example of what civil discourse is supposed to look like. And now if you have a written question uh, on an index card, would you please hold it up high so that the City Club staff can collect it from you? Thank you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from today's uh, Friday Forum host, Ken Ray. Ken is Senior Public Affairs Coordinator at Metro. He's been a City Club member for more than 10 years and has participated in the New Leaders Council, Friday Forum Committees, or Ballot Measure Studies, and he serves on the Board of Governors. Ken? 
Thank you both for being here today and participating. I want to pick up on a topic that Alan mentioned early in his remarks about voter registration edges in, uh, in Oregon. And is the path to victory statewide for the Republican Party in Oregon simply a need to increase your voter registration and attract more independents to the fold? Are there qualities in statewide candidates that we perhaps haven't seen yet, and what are those qualities and where do you find them? Or are you relying on uh, a large national Republican wave perhaps to sweep in a, a statewide candidate in Oregon? And then to Congressman Blumenauer, are there things that you see in the Democratic Party in Oregon that give you cause for concern um, that Democrats might at some point be at the risk of losing independence? Well, let me uh, first mention, and these numbers are stark, and I think they'll surprise some of you. The greatest political affiliation in the state still, by a small number, are Democrats. Republicans are actually number three. Number two is not registered to vote. There's over 700,000 people in the state that are not registered to vote, meaning they can't vote. Even if they wanted to vote, they can't vote. I think that's a tragedy. One, almost one in every four Oregonians that's eligible to vote is not registered to vote. And so when we're talking about, about these issues, roughly 25% are just not in the ballgame. The second thing is, is that the fastest growing group that is registering is none of the above. They don't want to register as a Democrat. They don't want to register as a Republican. And that's where I actually think, in many ways, we have an advantage because structurally, Republicans have to appeal to Republicans, independents, and Democrats in order to, to win. So I think it is, it, and to cut right to your question, it, I think it's candidate-based. I don't think, I can sit up here and give you words all day long, we can talk about platitudes and that kind of thing, but it's running incredibly good candidates, and I'd say Newt Bueller is a great example of that. Uh, that can appeal to both Republicans, independents, and Democrats. That's how we're going to win, and it's how we're going to increase our registration. We will now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a privilege of City Club membership. Before asking your question, please... So Pat, are you going to let me answer his question? Excuse me? Go right ahead. I, I don't need to. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just going to make two observations. One, uh, there has not been a Republican elected in a statewide office in Oregon in, since 2002. You didn't have to go there. <laughs> it's okay. The, I, I think if Democrats take that for granted, they're going to quickly find out that Oregonians are independent. They're not going to be taken for granted. They're not going to allow people to coast, and they shouldn't. Um, I think Oregonians are incredibly independent. We are a purple state. We're not, we're not red or blue. Uh, and you see it in some tough districts where uh, people will cross party lines. And you see it with people being selective about how they vote on some issues. Um, I wanted independents to be able to vote in the Democratic primary. Uh, I think that we ought to em embrace uh, that engagement. Um, but the political parties, per se, are at risk of being ossified um, and becoming irrelevant if we're not engaging with the issues that people care about, and that we're not bringing in new, fresh, innovative people uh, to be a part of the process. And, um, and I've watched the cycles come and go. I've been in the minority. I've been in the majority. Well, some would say I'm usually in the minority, and it has nothing to do with partisan uh, politics. Uh, but but it's, it's, that, it's that being engaged and realistic and in tune that's going to make the difference or not. Thank you, and I'm sorry for interrupting. No, that's quite all right. I, I'm used uh, to it. As I said, 
Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in less than 30 seconds. If I flash this question mark card, it means please wrap up your question. And I'll try to read at least one question from uh, the audience member index cards. I'd also mention to our speakers, it appears we have a number of people who would like to ask questions. So if we can make our responses brief, we'd appreciate it. So Leslie Lewis, City Club member and member of Transition PDX. My question is, is there, in your opinion, any remote possibility that the federal government will take any initiative on the huge challenge of climate change? Yes. Could you elaborate? <laughs> well, three things. Uh, one, um, I, I, the, the, the president has um, uh, been more than having a passing interest. It, be, it became politically toxic. Uh, it was, way, you know, terms like war on coal and weird stuff. I understand why he wasn't raising it at the highest levels, but this administration has done a great deal in terms of energy efficiency. The Recovery Act will go down in history as one of the biggest investments in alternative energy and efficiency. Uh, part of it is facts on the ground. Look, you know, what caused Chris Christie, you know, to kind of maybe, even though he was for Romney, he was disturbed at this climate denial, and you're watching Bloomberg and Christie and others that are dealing with the reality. Um, and, and again, it was the most brutal assault in the trenches, and it in the main did not work. It's going to be hard politically. But I think there are things that can be done incrementally. The president has done a number of things already. Um, there are Republican friends of mine that are looking at a carbon tax, a carbon tax, a national renewable portfolio standard. There are things that will move us in this direction. The question is if it will be soon enough. I, I'll, just say, I'll just say one thing on that. Uh, I think we have to be completely focused, number one, number two, and number three, on the economy. Uh, if, we're, if, we're not, if we're not focused on getting America competitive, getting America competitive internationally, uh, creating structures that get American businesses competitive, uh, my three kids that are right now sort of failing to launch along with uh, a lot of the rest of you, they're doing a really good job collecting degrees. And that's, that's terrific. They're the smartest baristas in the world. Uh, but we got to address that. And I'm also a technologist. And uh, much, much more efficient means of transportation are going to be developed over the next 20 years so that many of the problems that we see today that are almost insolvable to us are absolutely going to be solved. I've said many times, your paradigm of a 4,000-pound vehicle carrying a 230-pound person, where 94% of the energy goes into moving the vehicle and 6% goes into moving me, is ridiculous, right? But that's not what it's going to be as we roll forward with all these new technologies that we have. So um, I'm very optimistic that the energy profile of the world is actually going to be able to be decreased as we move forward. But right now, number one, number two, and number three, I think has to be economy and careers, economy and careers. I'm Edward Hershey, I'm a City Club member. Mr. Alley, I and a number of people I know admired your, night, your 2008 race against the late Ben Westland. You were witty, erudite, cerebral, and coming from the Kulingoski administration, remarkably nonpartisan. I guess my question is, first, what happened to that guy? He wasn't very evident in the 2010 primary for governor or since, and is that a reflection, as Governor Romney's transition may have been, that there isn't room for the moderate wing of the Oregon Republican Party that is so reflected in Congressman Blumenauer's wall photos? Well. Obviously, you're not a Facebook friend of mine or follow me on Twitter <laughs> because uh, I have a lot of, of friends on Facebook and Twitter that aren't just Republicans. 
And in fact, I get into a lot of trouble when I, when I get on Facebook and Twitter because it really is me. It's not, it's not some staff person uh, that's, that's doing it. Uh, I am the chairman of the Oregon Republican Party. It is a hyper-partisan position. I, I mean, it is, by definition. And I felt that that was a, uh, not necessarily the best thing for my political career, but I felt it was the best thing for Oregon. And I felt it was the best thing for the Oregon Republican Party in order for me to do that. And I think we've made some, some great strides in terms of some structural things that we've done with the party and some of the people that we're attracting to the party and some of the candidates that we're running in the party. We're not there yet. We haven't finished it yet. Uh, but I'd encourage you to follow me on Facebook and Twitter and engage. And we have some wonderful discussions with Republicans and Democrats uh, in both of those forums. And it really is me. I'm, I'm, I'm really the person pressing the buttons. Thank you for that, and thank you for this program. It's fabulous. Debbie Lynn Molyneux, City Club member. And I've been in conversation with many of my conservative friends over the last few days, and a lot of them are, are grieving, and some of them are very angry, of course, with the results of the election. And one of the things that I've come to understand is that for them, this is kind of like the end of an era the, and signaling the end of what has always been. And yet, there's a there seems to be a new social contract that's been that's in we're in the process of negotiating. I think a new way of living in our country with each other. And my question for you is, how do we reach out and really start working together again? Because I hear a lot of like talk about bipartisanship, and the, on the governmental level, but in you know with us, with us in the communities and stuff, how do we help support that in government so that? the partisanship doesn't take over and the parties actually represent the people. Well, I think it's, it's going to be driven by areas that we actually engage in specific things that potentially bring people together. My, I got a call at 2 a.m. election night, New York time, from a Republican colleague who called to congratulate me and say he wanted to work with me on our end-of-life care, death panels. Um, and that, to me, spoke volumes, because helping families know what they face in one of the most difficult times they're ever going to encounter, and then making sure their wishes, no matter what they are, are respected is something that 92% of the American public agrees on that somehow morphed into death panels with Sarah Palin and that I had a Republican colleague who is willing to reach out and say he thinks this is important in the new Congress and is willing to kind of move forward on that um, is the sort of thing that I think is going to make the difference there are I could give you a dozen examples of things that the American public wants, that if we just sit down and work on them, they can be worked through the, the political process. Our role as citizens is to make sure that people are doing it. They're not necessarily grand slam issues, you know, tax this or solving all of climate change, but there are so many second and third tier issues that make sense, that bring people together, that don't divide them. And if we individually try and adopt maybe one or two of those, and that we encourage people in Congress or the state legislature to do that, I think we can give people the sort of progress that will make all the difference in the world. And, and that is what's going to, I think, change the dynamic. We've lost the habit of working together. We've run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. Please join us next week to hear from Colette Peters who will describe best practices at the Oregon Department of Corrections. And as we close for today, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to today's moderator, Wendy Willis, and to our speakers, Alan Alley and Earl Bernard.